Okay, Colin, let me turn it over to you to uh, start off uh, the overview with Bruce, and then we'll proceed from there. Absolutely. Vic, thank you for that unbelievable ad. Just, uh, the, the, it, does, it gives me great joy to see those words coming out of your mouth. Thank you for the gracious, uh, the gracious bio. And uh, I will say also, it, it's an honor to be on the panel with you and Bruce, two of my heroes, in terms of spreading access to justice and, and quality dispute resolution around the world. So uh, delightful to meet everyone. Good morning. Um, good evening. I, I wish that uh, I could have used this uh, as an excuse to come to Georgia. Uh, because uh, all the representations Georgi has made about uh, the dumplings and the wine are incredibly enticing, but we find ourselves uh, victimized by the pandemic, so I'm going to have to take a rain check for now. But yes, let me talk just a little bit about what's, uh, what's happened around ODR. Uh, Georgi has informed me that, um, that ODRG has now been purchased, and it is ready to deploy uh, on quality online dispute resolution across Georgia. And that's very exciting, but it's it's been um, it's been humbling and and uh, amazing to watch online dispute resolution spread, um, but particularly over the last five years, maybe the last ten years. But I think we can all agree that uh, the pace of ODR's expansion has uh, has doubled, tripled, and quadrupled as a result of the pandemic. And you know, many great practitioners like Bruce and Vic, who have extensive experience doing face-to-face -face mediation. We have now been thrown into the world of ODR, and I've been talking about uh, online dispute resolution for 20 years. My wife jokes that the pandemic has done more to promote ODR in the last month than I have in the last 20 years. So um, I think what we're seeing is everyone is now an online mediator. Everyone is now an online arbitrator. And uh, practitioners who have said to me for decades, essentially over my dead body. I will not do this. I'm a face-to-face -face person. I don't believe that face -to -face, you can do dispute resolution over technology. Now they're emailing me saying, now, now how do I change my background on Zoom and how do I use a breakout room? Uh, it's just uh, by default. Uh, and, and again, the whole world has been changed by the pandemic, but it is definitely true that it has transformed legal services. It's transformed dispute resolution. So um, so let me just take a step back and say uh, online dispute resolution, we, we define it as the use of information and communication technology to help parties prevent, manage, and resolve their disputes. And I, I've said this for some time, and, and I think it's been uh, taken quite provocatively, but now it seems a little less provocative. I've always said that online dispute resolution is the future of alternative dispute resolution. And I actually believe that they are the same thing. Uh, if you look at what technology has done in other industries, such as medicine or finance or entertainment, technology has completely reinvented those industries. And if, if you think about finance in particular, uh, 30 years ago, there wasn't much technology in finance. <clears throat> you know, there were still people that traded shares by standing on the floor of the stock exchange and waving pieces of paper saying, who wants to buy 500 shares of IBM? Uh, and now all of those jobs are gone. Now computers handle all of those trades, but there are more people working in finance than ever before. And instead of standing on the floor of the stock exchange waving their pieces of paper, now they are programming the computers and the computers make those trades in milliseconds. And I think that's pretty good guidance probably for what is coming for legal services as well. I think as technology transforms the way that we interact with each other, it's also going to transform the legal system and by extension, the field of dispute resolution because uh, we live in the shadow of the law. So I, as, as Vic mentioned, I worked at eBay and PayPal from 2003 to 2011 and built something called the Resolution Center, which was a piece of software to resolve disputes between buyers and sellers on eBay in 16 different languages. We, we resolved, we had about 250 million users at the time and we resolved about 60 million disputes per year. And we got to the point where 50% of those resolutions were by mutual agreement, meaning buyer and seller worked out an agreement themselves. And 90% were resolved without a human, meaning an eBay employee or a third party neutral, having to touch the case. So what that means is it was the buyer and the seller working with technology to resolve most of their caseloads. And in 2011, I spun out some of that technology and created Modria. So, uh, what Modria did is we applied that resolution center to many other areas of dispute resolution, public disputes like tax disputes, insurance disputes. We run the largest case volume for the American Arbitration Association, the New York No Fault 
uh, volume, which resolves insurance disputes in the wake of motor vehicle accidents, um, product liability, consumer issues, many, many different types of disputes. So, of course, on the Internet, we have lots of disputes. Every eBay, eBay was big at the time, but now Amazon and Alibaba are much larger than eBay, and they have, they have many, many hundreds of millions of disputes. Uh, but then if you look at any site like Uber or Airbnb or TaskRabbit or Upwork, they all have disputes between their users. And those users are not located in the same geographic place. So you can imagine a buyer in Georgia buys an item from a seller in Argentina, and the item is drop shipped out of Hong Kong, and the marketplace that they buy it through is based in California. And the value of the item is only $75. So how are we going to resolve a dispute like that through the traditional legal system? Uh, the jurisdiction is very confused. The value of the item is too low to pay for the services of a lawyer. So really, uh, one of the things we say in the ODR field is there's no A in ODR. ODR is not an alternative. Uh, we talk about alternative dispute resolution. It's an alternative to the courts. But in many circumstances, online dispute resolution is the only option available for parties to resolve their disputes, especially now in the pandemic where people can't get together face to face. So what we are seeing now is a flowering of ODR all around the world. And people are building national ODR systems, much like you're talking about doing in, in Georgia. But uh, we've seen ODR take over in China and in Singapore. Uh, there's experiments. The European Union has launched a regulation that requires all professional e-commerce sellers to provide online dispute resolution links to their consumers. Uh, we see on, all online courts emerging in places like the UK, where they're launching, launching something called Her Majesty's Online Court, where you don't have to show up in person, you don't have to have a lawyer, and it can handle low dollar value civil cases. Canada has launched a similar online court using ODR called the Civil Resolution Tribunal in British Columbia. So, uh, we, and we see international organizations promoting ODR left and right. Um, UNCITRAL, which is the UN agency responsible for harmonizing global laws, had a working group on ODR that met for seven years and uh, it ended up with a general assembly recommendation to expand the use of ODR. Uh, APEC, which is the international organization of countries that, that, uh, that are around the Pacific Ocean. They're launching an ODR system for resolving small and medium-sized business disputes. And now the ISO, the International Standards Organization, has kicked off an effort to create online dispute resolution standards for cross-border e-commerce transactions. So I think a lot of the people who are thinking about how are we going to provide justice, how are we going to provide fast and fair resolutions in our newly networked world, they look at the legal system and say, wow, this system is so tied to geography. It's so tied to jurisdiction. And that's kind of a meaningless question on the internet. It's very difficult to establish where a dispute takes place or what law governs that dispute. And I think they're realizing that online dispute resolution is a better fit because it's a redress system, a justice system that works the way the internet works. You don't have to worry about jurisdiction. You can build redress directly in to the agreement uh, or directly into the platform where the transaction originally occurred. So we are now seeing online dispute resolution expand beyond purely transactional and commercial matters into more relationship centric disputes like workplace disputes and family disputes. Uh, so on, online dispute resolution, it's very difficult to put your arms around it now. It's growing in so many different directions. Yes, we have computer-mediated communications, kind of like this, where we can do mediations over Zoom, but we also have artificial intelligence and machine learning, where computers are learning to help uh, parties resolve their disputes. We have crowdsourced solutions like Kleros.io, where uh, people can log in and they can put their dispute in front of a panel of people from all around the world who will then vote on what the appropriate outcome should be. We also have uh, blockchain and smart contracts, which is part of the rollout of virtual currencies. Um, and they are relying on online dispute resolution as well to resolve disputes because there's a vision of a, a new justice system that we're building, which is not backed by the coercive power of the state. Instead, it's backed by code and it's backed by math, and online dispute resolution is a good fit with that future justice system. So it's a very exciting time. The progress we've made over the last five, 10 years is, is really dizzying, 
But if anything, I see the progress continuing to accelerate. And I'm seeing ODR services launch all over the world. The software is getting better. The party openness to the use of these tools is getting stronger. It's uh, when you see a country launch their dispute resolution program, now they make it online from inception. And there's no controversy at all about the use of technology to resolve disputes. So it's not really about where we are today, it's about where we're going. And if you think about uh, 20 years ago when we started this, there was no Facebook, there was no iPhone. It's amazing to think about how much technological progress has occurred in that time. And what's gonna come over the next five or 10 years? Uh, other technologies. And we in the, the online dispute resolution field will be able to leverage those technologies to help people get access to justice and find fair resolutions. So it's an exciting time. If anything, it can be a little overwhelming for mediators and lawyers to, to, to say, wow, what does this mean for me? But I think, as I said, there are more people working in finance and medicine than ever before, and technology has created opportunities. And I think the same will be true in dispute resolution. So there's some opening comments, Vic. I could go on, but uh, I want to save some time for, the, for you and Bruce to chat sure. as well. Sure. Well, that's really helpful by way of an overview. Thanks so much, Colin. And it is truly an exciting, very exciting time. And I think one of the, I guess, part of the civil lining, if you will, in the clouds right now of the pandemic is to watch how really well-suited uh, ODR has become to move forward to giving people, providing access to justice and providing peaceful dispute, dispute resolution in a way, frankly, the courts never could provide, uh, even to do it better, if you will, in a time of real crisis in terms of the, uh, the health issues that the, the world is facing right now. So with that, Bruce, let me turn it over to you uh, and ask you, if you would, to share your perspectives uh, from the extensive experience you have and, and anything that you uh, might want to add with respect to your exposure to Georgia in the past and what you see coming down the pike. Again, thanks, uh, Vic and uh, Georgi, for the kind introduction. I'm just sorry you uh, didn't hit the record button in time to kind of capture all of those uh, introductions. But, um, it's great to be with you again, Vic. Uh, Vic is one of the best trainers in the world. He and I have been together in India and Brazil and points in between. It's a pleasure to spend time with him. Uh, my friend Colin, we don't get enough time together, but it's always a privilege to be on a panel with you. As I described once before, when I had the pleasure of interviewing you over a year ago now, it was kind of like being on a panel to talk about the Old Testament and then look to my left and there's Moses, you know, sitting there. <laughs> and that's kind of how I feel about Colin and his role in the United States and developing uh, ODR. <clears throat> yeah, if, if Colin gave you a, a great, and he did, uh, overview of what's happening in the world of ODR, <clears throat> um, or literally around the world, kind of a macro perspective, if you will, uh, I'll, I'll focus my comments a little bit more on a micro level, meaning the, the view from a practitioner's perspective and how um, those of us sort of in the trenches have been impacted by recent events and certainly uh, what some of those uh, uh, lessons are for the future. Um, historically, I think we were moving in this direction anyway, albeit slowly. I mean, my individual mediation practice was such that uh, we were starting to find ourselves using uh, various types of, uh, of technology and mediation, whether it was uh, involving people by Skype or uh, sort of following up in mediations using um, real-time texting and emails and phone calls and everything in between, uh, sometimes during the middle of mediation, uh, but certainly in follow-up, uh, it became kind of a 24-7 uh, you know, process for those of us uh, in complex cases with multiple parties trying to piece together uh, complicated settlements. <clears throat> and, and that was sort of our historical approach. It was gathering some steam, but I described it as a little bit like dancing with a porcupine, uh, meaning you'd get close, but you weren't quite fully embraced you know, with the concept. And, <clears throat> um, and then all of a sudden, obviously, the COVID uh, hit. And quite literally, I was in the middle of a two-day mediation with uh, 24 parties uh, at the end of the first day when they came in the room and said, we're closing up tonight, so everybody get your stuff and leave the building. <clears throat> and that's how this whole process started for me. I immediately went home, got on the YouTube Zoom tutorials and uh, started uh, learning things that I'd never thought I would learn before. And uh, <clears throat> as Colin said so eloquently, you know, probably caught up more in that week than I had in the last couple of years regarding uh, uh, you know, online technologies and trying to put those into practice. 
Since then, I've literally been mediating every day on the Zoom platform when I'm not conducting training. And uh, many of you I've had the privilege of meeting and working with. You already know some of the opportunities that the uh, online world presents for, for training. Uh, little did I know seven or eight years ago when my wife and I started the uh, Edwards Mediation Academy and the online training materials that uh, we would find ourselves in this environment where uh, it really is the only opportunity for many to continue their learning processes and for us to support from the distance some of those learning efforts. Um, but the, the sort of online experience, and, and it doesn't have to be the Zoom platform, although that's what I've been using and I think most people have predominantly, there is there are a number of platforms out there including some that are under development specifically for use in the uh, mediation world um, but I, I, I'll touch on just a couple benefits of it and some of the challenges from a practitioner's perspective uh, without getting too deeply into it um, but one of the unique things of the uh, zoom platform and, and online dispute resolution that I've found is that you really can uh, get a, a, a full participation from all the stakeholders. And it's not unusual now in my experience to have a much broader audience to work with. People who historically would not have participated from points distant, you know, on the East Coast in our country, 3,000 miles away, or even Canada, countries up north, um, they now find their way onto the Zoom mediations and I can involve them directly in the face-to-face -face conversations whereas before they would have not been authorized to travel or willing to spend the money, they're now part of the process. And to that extent, it allows us to cast a wider net and ultimately uh, involve you know, everybody that's uh, necessary for decisions. Um, I find that the process itself is a bit more focused. You know, people are drawn into the box. People are <clears throat> forced really to sort of confront their own sort of technological divide. And once overcoming it, they are really uh, uh, sort of in the moment. And to that extent, it's both uh, um, engaging and exhausting at both ends of the, the visual. Um, I've also found that it gives us a little peek into people's lives. You know, as you're sitting here looking at Vic, and if that's not a, you know, a, a, a screen in his background, you know, you see that Vic's a well-studied, well-read man with all those books. <laughs> you know, we get a little, we get a little perspective. I, I was mediating a case visually uh, coming out of Las Vegas. Um, uh, several weeks back and, and it involved a horrific accident and a gentleman, a young gentleman who'd been paralyzed in an accident. And he was uh, in a hospital bed, you know, in his living room. And uh, it wasn't set up this way, but uh, obviously the opportunity to see him in his home environment with the kind of care that uh, was rendered almost moment to moment as we were going through the day was very eye-opening, very telling uh, and to those on the screen who probably had never contemplated what it must be like to be uh, a, a semi-quadriplegic uh, you know, victim. And so you know, there are benefits to this process. I could go on, but just to give you a practitioner's view, um, <clears throat> those are some. It obviously has challenges too. Um, certainly getting people comfortable with the uh, technology. You know, there's a learning curve involved. In a minute, I'll give you a tip or two on sort of how I've tried to address that. <clears throat> um, there's always challenges, as in any mediation, trying to get people comfortable um, and connect with people. Uh, I do want to emphasize one point as we're sort of talking about this and before we throw it open to questions. Um, it's, it is as imperative as it was before that people perfect their skills in mediation or arbitration or the other sort of underlying uh, modalities that they're going to be addressing before you get to become fluent in the technology. I've tried to figure out the right metaphor and I'm not sure I've stumbled on it yet, but it's a little bit like learning to drive a car and then the person seated in the passenger seat next to you at the same time is trying to teach you Spanish or some other foreign language. <clears throat> and, and you still have to learn to drive the car, <clears throat> you know, or you're gonna be speaking Spanish and getting into a lot of accidents. And you know, that's a little bit what it feels like you know, with the technology. You need to become so comfortable in the mediation skill and providing the service itself that the technology itself doesn't distract you, you know, from the skills that you're offering. And so don't, don't look at uh, the technology as a panacea or as something that's going to sort of cover the blemishes of the lack of mediation experience. Perfect those skills at the same time you're getting comfortable with the technology, and then you'll be the best of both worlds. As, as Colin said, this is not a 
this is not a binary choice. It's not a question of, you know, are we doing this, uh, you know, online? We're doing this in person. I think it's pretty clear that uh, the technology is here to stay. That was an, an early debate, you know, in our industry. We're well beyond that now. Really, it's a question of what's the rightful place for these technologies in our day-to-day -day environment. And COVID has certainly brought home the fact that, you know, <clears throat> now on, on any given day, it may be the only choice. And it may be the only choice because people are in distant communities and it doesn't make sense to get together. Obviously, the uh, health environment that we're all in at the moment uh, dictates uh, more often than not this kind of approach, uh, even though I've still done a couple in-person mediations at a courthouse or in our office in the last several months, wearing masks and sort of fussing with that uh, uh, you know, kind of approach. Um, but the, it's not a binary choice. It really is a valuable uh, uh, option not to be described as an alternative. Uh, I think it's here to stay now that people have gotten past, many people have gotten past the technology curve. I recently had a lawyer in Southern California, uh, you know, about a, an hour and a half flight distant from where I work most days, who said to me at the conclusion of a successful mediation day, he said, Bruce, why would I ever get up at 4 a.m. now and get on a 6 a.m. flight at the LAX, the Los Angeles airport, and, and hassle all of that commute just to get to your office and conduct a mediation and reverse the commute at the end of the day, when I can do that same thing sitting here at home in my pajamas and my slippers that you can't see, you know, underneath the desk. And I said, well, we do have good meals, you know, we serve for lunch. And he said, well, that's, you know, not quite uh, compelling enough. <laughs> but the point is, it's, it is here to stay. Um, there are uh, lots of things as you get deeper into this world that we can assist you with. And as Georgi said at the beginning, we stand ready to help you. I mean, uh, whether it's, um, uh, whether it's webinars. I mean, yesterday I did a webinar for two hours with a group where judges were training in uh, mediation skills in Zambia, in Africa. Uh, Georgi knows many of you on this call have already participated in webinars that uh, I've been involved with or Vic's been involved with, helping you with mediation skill development. We're now launching our newest course on uh, mediation advocacy for lawyers as you in Tbilisi and Georgia develop the broader mediation community. Obviously, the lawyers are a critical stakeholder group in that effort, and we're going to be uh, working with you uh, remotely uh, by Zoom, trying to help uh, bring those uh, skills and lessons to bear. So the future is bright, you know, going forward for all of this, uh, whether it's, it's uh, active training or it's mediation or arbitration online. And uh, I'm excited about the future for it. I mean, I was uh, probably, as I said, a, a slower role into this world than many, given my age and sort of lack of, of technology background. Um, but uh, uh, there's always a silver lining, as my, one of my friends who I teach with, who's a psychotherapist, says, uh, you know, when one door in life closes, another opens. And uh, for me, um, when the door of sort of day-to-day, face-to-face mediation closed, it did force me to walk down the hall and find this other open door. And I'm, I'm moving through it uh, gradually, as are many others. And I do think... Uh, uh, it'll be exciting to see where that leads us over time. Um, but for those of you who get deeper into this, uh, there are different resource materials that we can provide. Um, I've written blog, I mean, I've written blogs, I've published some things on specific skills for mediating online. Um, we have uh, webinars that are available on the same subject and certainly uh, the opportunity to support Georgi and all of you in different capacities is what uh, Colin and Victor and I stand ready to do. So thank you very much, uh, those of you who are meeting for the first time and those of you who uh, um, I've been with before for the opportunity to uh, present today and to answer questions and just be part of your collective efforts uh, moving this stuff forward. Yuri, uh, if I may, I'd like to put one question uh, before you ask uh, those that you may uh, want to address. Uh, that both uh, Colin and Bruce have stimulated uh, to both of them. And it really will give it a very Georgian spin. And I want to relate to, uh, 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 Bruce made a reference to training of uh, lawyers in Georgia. And I remember uh, having a group of lawyers together in a Georgian meeting, there were about 40 of them. And I was talking about the unique skills you need to advocate for clients in a mediation and how that uh, is distinguished from advocating in court. And I made some reference rather uh, casually that if you want to make peace with your enemies, uh, mediation can provide an excellent, and I, I didn't even get to finish the sentence before three hands shot up in the audience of 
of the lawyers that were sitting there, and they said, Vic, why do we want to make peace with our enemies? We want to <laughs> kill them. We want to beat them up. We want to drag them before a judge, and we want the judge to say, we are right and you are wrong, and to rip off their nails kind of one finger at a time. So my question with this little uh, shocking interruption that I had in my presentation to Bruce and to Colin, um, and I'll be happy to comment on this as well, but it's a very Georgian challenge. It's not unique to Georgia. We see it in many countries, but it's particularly characteristic of the Georgian mindset. How do you build trust with something like ODR in a country that is very adversarial in its mindset and its thinking? It was hard enough to do it when we did person, person to person, uh, experiences where we could do it, build the, the in the relationship, the personal interchange. Uh, but how do you do it in trying to sell and present ODR? If you have any observations from your international experience or your national experience that would apply in Georgia, how do you help build trust so that there will be an embracing or at least a re receptivity uh, to using ODR and the various uh, approaches? Sure. Well, Bruce, do you want to take a swing at it, or should I? I will follow over? your lead. I will follow your lead. Thank you. <laughs> sure, sure. I love that anecdote, uh, Vic. That's 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 great. We want to rip their fingernails out. Come on, uh, you know. I, I think uh, some of the the work that I've done at the, that you mentioned at the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, you know, uh, I've 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 had the chance to interact with some very wise peacemakers from around the world, and and one of the lessons that I've learned there is, you know, you don't make peace with your friends. You make peace with your enemies. And, uh, you know, if, if you were just reaching agreement with people that you loved and trusted, well, it'd be easy. But unfortunately, those are usually not the people that you need to, uh, to resolve disputes with. Now, one thing I will say, um, I am a mediator. I'm what they call a non-lawyer mediator. Uh, I never went to law school. Uh, I'm still a little fuzzy on what a tort is. And I, I think that that's actually a, a feature, not a bug, because I don't think about things the same way that uh, the many lawyers think about things. And I'm dealing with two very esteemed and experienced lawyers here on the call. Uh, so one of the things that I will say is my inclination is always to use facilitative mediation to resolve disputes. But I have met many parties who want to fight it out and they want to go into an evaluative process and that's what they're looking for. And, you know, one of the, I think, uh, the, the geniuses uh, uh, behind the design of jams is that jams can offer both. Uh, and uh, I think that's true of online dispute resolution as well. I think uh, it doesn't always have to be a facilitated dialogue uh, between two disputants to come up with a mutually agreed upon outcome. Uh, if somebody wants to go knock down, drag out and have a, an evaluative process and, you know, uh, just tear into the other side and have a trusted third party come in and render the decision, that's fine. We can do that through technology too. Um, but again, in trying to promote mediation, a very experienced mediator uh, told me just the other day, and I love this phrase. He said, mediation is the art of getting people to do things that they didn't know that they wanted to do. Uh, and uh, another mediator said to me, um, you know, mediation is the art of benevolent manipulation. And I think that there is an element of trust building behind it. Uh, the thing about technology that's interesting is uh, technology is not a what, technology is a how. Uh, you can do anything you want over technology. Um, you know, if you want to hold a court case over technology, if you want to do a mediation over technology, you want to do a settlement conference, you want to do a, a meet arb, that's fine. You know, we could design, we could put the technology together to support all of those processes. And uh, when you do talk about trust building in technology itself, I think that's something that's very interesting. I mean, listening to Bruce narrate, you know, to be in the middle of a mediation and have them walk into the room and say, get your stuff together, pack it up because we're done. You got, you know, we got it. We're shutting this place down. I mean, that's a very stark example of how people were thrown into this. But what's amazing to me is again, uh, six months ago, I would say to someone, Hey, can we do this over zoom? And they would say, what zoom? And now I say, well, can we do this over zoom? And they say, okay, no problem. What's the link? What's the meeting ID? The, the trust in technology has changed quite a bit. And I do think that the world of six months ago is gone forever, as Bruce notes. We're never going to go back to that. And as much as I enjoy traveling, it is, it's a bear to, I mean, going to Georgia to me is worth all the investment of the airports and the passport lines and the et cetera, et cetera. Going to LA, I mean, I've been there a dozen times. Really, do I need to get up at 4 a.m. to go down there so I can shake your hand 
and then head back, you know, at the end of the day. No, we can do that over Zoom. So the trust that's been built in technology, I think, is not going away. I think Zoom is the new telephone, and there's nothing controversial about it, and I think parties are going to be comfortable with it. Now, not every country uses Zoom in the same way. Some countries it's WhatsApp. Some countries it's GoToMeeting. Some countries it's another platform. But the, the trust is a key element. Because when you're trying to sell someone on an online dispute resolution process, you kind of have two sales. One is selling the technology and the other is selling dispute resolution. And what I've seen amazingly from the pandemic is we no longer really have to sell the technology. People say, okay, that's of course, of course we're going to be doing this over Zoom. Now let's talk about the process. So, uh, so again, we are still in the middle of this transition. It's not like we're 100% there, but it's amazing to me how quickly we've gone from 15% to 70%. And I think the last 30%, inevitably, we're going, to be, we're going to be traversing that over the next few years as well. So, Bruce, I'm, I'm curious to see if you see things differently. No, I don't. I think your, your comments are well taken and right on. I think, again, to go back to my metaphor of sort of driving the car while learning Spanish, the driving the car piece of this is the mediation skill. And as everybody on the call probably already knows well, sort of the trust building uh, is central to what we do as mediators. And, and it rather, regardless of whether it's in a face-to-face -face environment or an online environment, which I'll talk about in a moment, it's critical to resolving these, some, these sort of intractable you know, uh, disputes. It's, um, I think it was Brian McGill who said, one of the most sincere forms of respect and trust building starts with actually listening to what each other has to say. And that's true whether you're in an in-person environment or you're in an online environment. Um, in the, the online, oh, the other piece that I would say is, is don't view technology uh, for, as an excuse for the kind of hard work that's required to accomplish this task. Getting people beyond these kinds of positions where they want to rip each other's fingernails off is a time-consuming task. And it starts with trying to help people find common ground. George Mitchell, uh, a former uh, Secretary of State and Senator in the United States, uh, was instrumental in bringing about some of the uh, peace agreement with the Troubles in Northern Ireland and wrote a book about his experience as, as a Secretary of State. And he talked about the importance of really trying to uh, initiate a dialogue, find common ground between people who have disparate interests. Uh, it, for him, uh, using an example of his time uh, trying to build a bridge with Fidel Castro, uh, he started talking about baseball and uh, th there's their simple uh, common shared interest in all things related to baseball allowed them to find their sort of common humanity and build on uh, trust and respect based on those conversations. And the sort of the same is true in what we do. We're always looking for those ways as mediators to build those connections between people. Technology actually, I think, affords us an added tool in that endeavor by allowing people sort of to come together from distant environments. Yes, there may be some limitations, but I, I'll look at the glass as being half full. It allows people to, as I said already, sort of see uh, inside each other's homes, let their hair down because they're already in a safe environment. Uh, as they speak with each other. Um, and, and this idea of, of sort of building connections, building trust, um, using an online platform is, is an exciting uh, aspect of really what we're trying to do on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis. But don't think for a moment that anything, mediation or, or technology, is, is an answer to the hard work that's required in sort of developing you know, those bridges. I'm, I'm on a... Uh, executive uh, advisory board for an uh, organization in Washington, D.C. called Convergence.org. And they will grapple with uh, social issues and bring together people who never thought for a moment they could sit in the same room with each other to talk about such divisive issues as health care legislation, immigration, gun control, reimagining you know, education, very divisive issues within our country. And this group brings these people together, establishes uh, relationships, uh, <clears throat> spending you know, hours at a time, leading up to days at a time, just to try and develop that level of trust that we're talking about in this conversation. And technology will help us achieve those things, perhaps in ways that you know, we couldn't before with people maybe being unwilling to sort of make those time commitments or other commitments to that effort. And of course, the facilitated aspect of it, as Colin says, is central to sort of keeping those uh, efforts moving forward, keeping people on a productive path and, and, and trying to build that sort of trust that is so central to what we do. 
Yogi, before I turn it over to you, I just had one observation I wanted to make, if I may, in response mm -hmm. to Colin and Bruce. Of course. Uh, and again, keeping Georgia very much in mind, the hard work that Bruce refers to is such an important thing to appreciate. Because if one thinks of ODR and mediation in the context of traditional private caucusing and joint caucusing and the like, but misses the opportunity to build trust by developing, if you will, in each mediation, a personal relationship, even through the technology of ODR, then you're really missing an opportunity uh, that's critical to successful outcomes. And by that, I mean, one of the techniques that I've used, and I know that Bruce and Colin are very, very familiar with this, and have many aspects of this that they have uh, experienced, is developing relationships through the technology, uh, with the mediator to the lawyers, and then making sure that the lawyers are well informed on how to approach their clients about what the process is, so they get to understand and trust the process, both the lawyers need to understand the process and their clients do. And I have found one of the most successful techniques here in the United States for me, and I think would apply in Georgia and around the world, is the time that a mediator takes to speak to the lawyers in advance of the mediation uh, to reach agreement. Sometimes it's both lawyers or the multiple lawyers that are into the dispute. Explain, reach agreement as to what the ODR process is, how you're going to proceed with respect to uh, individual caucuses and joint caucuses and whether or not which parties are going to be there and also to invite them for private uh, conversation with you as the mediator with the agreement of the parties private conversation about their concerns and their questions so that before you get into the mediation the pure mediation process itself you've already built a rapport and a trust in the process that you're presenting and the last thing that I would mention is teaching lawyers or representatives how to sell to their clients the mediation process. How, and this is very important in Georgia, one of the greatest fears of the lawyers in Georgia, and by the way, in India and in Brazil and in other countries that I've worked is, the lawyers are afraid to suggest mediation because their clients may perceive that they are afraid to litigate the case. And that showing of a potential weakness feels, they feel, that they're gonna lose credibility with their clients. So teaching lawyers on how to raise with their clients the possibility of utilizing mediation and or arbitration or meet arbitration without looking weak and making sure the clients know you're ready to litigate the case to the nth degree, that is a skill in itself. So teaching lawyers uh, how to do this and speaking to the executives at the Bar Association and giving them confidence in how to raise it without losing face with their clients becomes really important to build trust. Can I, can I comment on one, one aspect of what you said? Because I think it dovetails nicely with what we're talking about today. The substantive importance of convening activities of which you described so well, meeting with lawyers, clients in advance of the mediation, starting that trust building process. It also affords a great opportunity to introduce people and get them comfortable with the technology. And so what I've been doing of late in cases is offering people the chance to sort of meet with me virtually on a Zoom platform in advance of the mediation, often with their clients, gives them a chance to get comfortable with the technology. They get over that initial sort of fear factor if they haven't used it before. I sort of introduce them to sort of how I bounce them around from private breakout rooms to joint sessions and different things. And by the time we get to the real event days later, they're almost starred veterans now of the technology and feel comfortable in its use. And so it, it, it satisfies both the important substantive issues that you describe at the same time, it introduces them to the technology and, and sort of starts us on uh, uh, sort of fluid footing when we actually get to the mediation event. Georgi? Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, excellent points you three made. Uh, and. Uh, I, of course, I have uh, some questions, but as I have this excellent opportunity to ask these questions to you anytime, so I will not take time uh, on this. And before we proceed to the questions, and uh, I have counted, we have about three questions here. Uh, I see that the president of European Business Association, David Lee, uh, is also with us. And uh, David is one of the 
big believers of mediation in Georgian business circles. Uh, he also has worked with Bruce and they know each other. And I just want to ask David to say us a couple of words because it was with his excellent support to create EBA MAC, European Business Association Mediation and Arbitration Center. David helps us a lot to uh, get new clients, to get confidence and to get trust uh, in Georgian business. And I just want David uh, to say a couple of words if he wishes to do so. Uh, thank you very much, Georgi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Of course. Course. Okay, that's great. Uh, David, are you in London? You. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm in the UK. I can't go back at the moment. Uh, there's not a corridor between the UK and, uh, and Georgia. But it's, uh, it's nice to see uh, the, uh, the experts, many of whom I met in Georgia when we met uh, with the Prime Minister uh, just over a year ago. And um, I'll just very quickly talk about the European Business Association and why we wanted to have a, an EBA mediation and arbitration, me, uh, EBA MAC. And the reason we formed the association is because we believe that a tipping point has occurred in Georgia around about 2014, 2017, with the signing of the association agreement and then the subsequent um, visa-free travel. So the direction of Georgia now is quite clear. Um, you would have a very difficult time arguing that Georgia is trying to go back to its Soviet past. Um, every survey that we see now suggests that Georgia is one of the easiest places to do business. In the Eastern Partnership of the European Union, it is the leader in reforms for both democracy um, and reforms for business and investment. So it's sitting in a very good place and we were getting feedback from our members that one of the problems they face is the court system, as do many countries. And the reasons were somewhat political in that some people thought they might be biased, but some of them were actually problems I think that we see all over the world. And that was to do with cost mm. and timing. Most businesses that, uh, I'm, I'm a businessman, so a lot of businessmen and businesswomen, what they really want is a judgment that is valid and they want it quickly and they want it at a reasonable price. And when I met with Georgi and he explained to me, um, and I was very skeptical, what this mediation, arbitration, um, alternative dispute resolution, what it was all about, it took me a while and then I suddenly got it. Instead of going to the government or to the press and complaining about the court system, why don't we create something that in certain circumstances is better, particularly perhaps for business. And uh, Georgi is a very professional guy and, and I believed him. And then I met some of the experts who are in this meeting today and we formed the EBA MAC. Now, I wanna go back to a couple of things that you already mentioned. One of them I think was quite pertinent was that, will they, you know, will they trust their lawyers if the lawyer says to do this? And what if, what if the culture of the country is so aggressive that they could never mediate? Well, I can put your mind at ease there. I think that there's a misconception about what the Georgian culture is. At its root, it's very practical. And if this is a practical solution to people's problems, they will accept it. The number one thing that's lacking in Georgia in this sphere is trust. It's trust. The post-Soviet states don't trust people. They certainly don't trust the government, but they also don't trust lawyers. They don't trust doctors. They don't trust people because they assume that they have a bias. And when we formed the European Business Association itself in 2017, one of the reasons we formed it is that we thought that the associations had lost the trust of the businesses. And we created an organization that was completely independent. We didn't ask for grants. We're not beholden to anybody. We created an organization that had no possibility of becoming political because our statutes do not allow us to make political comments. And 
we created this organization on the basis that we had to have a brand that people trusted. And our big idea was that the difference between European Business Association and let's say the rest of the world, when you got to the root of it, was that doing business in Europe, doing business in, in America, doing business in a democracy, a Western democracy is about a set of values. And these values are somewhat universal. And one of them is trust. And so our brand, the European Business Association, has a very carefully protected attribute of trust. And I believe very strongly that when people look for an alternative to going to court and they look and you explain to them how this process works, and if it's coming from an organization with the trust of the European Business Association, I think you're onto a winner. And I don't believe that the culture of Georgia is so um, aggressive that, they, that people won't, won't be able to accept this. And then just the last thing I picked up listening to you today was the concept of technology. This technology change, uh, I agree with everything that's been said, the use of Zoom, we formed as an organization three years ago. And one of the things people would criticize us for is that we were too reliant on social media, too reliant on messaging, electronic messaging. And now, of course, they realize that we were ahead of the game. You know, we have three, four, five times more followers than the biggest associations in the country. We're the most followed business association in the Caucasus. And one of the things I think that you should look at with technology is that technology will work for you because what people will be looking for as part of their process are the faces we see on this screen today where possible. They'll be looking for people to be able to enter into the conversation and into the process that aren't necessarily in Georgia. I don't really understand why, but there is a perception in Georgia, I think I'm right in saying, that European standards, American standards in the legal area, less so in the medical area, but certainly the legal area are higher. And therefore, everything we can do to bring that expertise and that independence into the process will, will pay huge dividends. Um, and I'm no lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, but I sense that one of the reasons that people come to London uh, or go to American court systems who are not British or American is because they trust the system. And I think EBA Mac can be the leader in that area. Trust, values, professionalism, and I think people are going to want to want to use us. So thank you very much for the opportunity, Gary. Thank you very much, David. And now uh, everybody can see why I trust so much to uh, the success of online dispute resolution with European Business Association, because David is the most online business guy in the country, and sometimes. <laughs> I don't believe he's a real person. He only exists online. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you, David, for, uh, for excellent points you made. And uh, I, I, I strongly believe that we will be able to develop also uh, the ODR thing together. And this will be our uh, brand and know-how, not only in Georgia, but also regionally, but the, uh, because the other countries the neighboring countries are also very interested and I have very close contact to them. And I strongly believe they uh, will follow us and they will be with us uh, in developing uh, these things. Of course, we cannot do it without the support of our friends and experts, especially from the US and you guys here. Thank you very much once more. And I just want to proceed with the questions because I see we don't have that much time, which is of course limited. The first question, I like this question very much, and I've uh, heard this story from Wick and Bruce, and I just want to ask both of them to uh, repeat it once more for the bigger audience. And of course, Colin, you can, uh, you need also to jump in. Uh, when you were beginners of mediation, <laughs> when you just graduated or just were young lawyers with no experience or very small experience, and then suddenly you realize there is ADR. So what was the main obstacles and impediments 
and inconveniences and how, how do you feel it about it now from your perspective and from, from your experience and from everything you have already uh, done in this sector? Vic, you first. Should I go first? Please. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I, I, we'll all try and be brief because time is short and there are a number of questions that we want to try and get to. Uh, for me, uh, when I graduated law school, like most lawyers that have been trained, uh, I had the fangs were out and I just was ready to go out there and to litigate and rip the insides of my adversaries out and win my cases. And uh, that was the way I was trained. Um, and my first introduction uh, to uh, mediation and the process of dispute resolution uh, outside of litigation was to a federal court training program some 25 years ago in which the judges came to a group of so-called prominent lawyers in San Francisco. They took 25 of us that had been identified and they asked if we would help the courts uh, to deal with the backlog, a very big backlog we had in those days uh, by taking on these cases, learn what mediation was about, uh, learn the skills and volunteer our time for the court system. And that was my if you will, epiphany. That was my first introduction into what uh, mediation was about. And uh, we went through a 40 hour course and then we went through uh, coaching and training and, um, and sitting in on other experienced people at that time. There weren't that many around at that time. Uh, Bruce was just getting started in those days, if I'm not mistaken, he'll probably make reference to that. Uh, knocking on doors, trying to develop a clientele. And when I saw the magic of bringing parties together and watching them move from a position of proving who was right and wrong off of that position and say, we're going to agree to disagree about who is right and wrong and move on to find a solution to the problem and move on to really address our interest. It was a magical experience. And that was for me, a turning point. So uh, from that time, uh, some many decades ago, I started recommending our clients into the process, and then I started to volunteer on my own, uh, outside of my clients that are represented as an advocate, uh, to do neutral uh, uh, mediation where I was asked by non-clients to serve as a mediator. Mm -hmm. So that's how I made the transition, ultimately leading, leading to my retirement and my full-time involvement with my foundation in promoting mediation around the world. So that's uh, my story, a little bit longer than it perhaps it should have been. Uh, Bruce, how about you? And then Colin? Vic, you're retired in name only. Just so <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, and and uh, David Lee, it's nice to see you uh, and listen to you. It's uh, been too long. So great to hear you again. And congratulations on all the good work you're doing with the European Business Association. I look forward to the day we can be together again. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> The, uh, the, the, my story is a little different. People have heard it, many of you who I've worked with before, but my background was in psychology before law, although I always thought that a lawyer was my calling. But in my early years of being a lawyer, uh, I realized that um, the type of experience that my clients had in the dispute resolution process was sort of less than satisfying at a personal level, at a psychological level. And it just started me thinking about the things that we were missing out on in our sort of historical approach to justice. We weren't involving clients in making the decisions that impacted the rest of their lives. We truly weren't listening to them in any meaningful way that gave them the kind of solace and respect and understanding that they deserve being involved in conflict. <clears throat> and we really just weren't applying the sort of psychological, basic psychological lessons that address people's needs when they're in conflict. And the more I thought about that, the more I realized the shortcomings of our legal system and thought that uh, maybe there was a better way. Many people were sort of doing similar things. It was the mid 1980s. Uh, you know, I was still in my 20s. I was a young lawyer in a law firm. Um, and as I sort of started to experiment with this idea of bringing people together and shepherding their conversations, uh, I, I stumbled on really the value of this process itself. Because at the end of the day, that's really what it's all about. I think uh, the, the process sort of speaks for itself, Vic and, and, and Colin and those of us that sort of find ourselves in the room 
uh, watching this process evolve over different days through different conflicts, realize that, yeah, there's skill involved at the end of the table and sort of keeping the parties moving forward. But the process itself is really the magic sauce, if you will, that, uh, you know, we all help provide. Um, and this, this idea, you asked the question, you know, Vic, what are the main obstacles, you know, that we found in those early days? I tell this story in part because when I left the law firm, much to my parents' chagrin, <laughs> that, you know, what was I doing, leaving my sort of lifelong pursuit of the law to start in a thousand square foot office with another gentleman uh, trying to, you know, uh, sell this concept of mediation that nobody had ever heard of before or very few people had. I tell people that story because if I can do it, you can do it. I wasn't a retired judge with uh, a name recognition. I wasn't, you know, Vic Schachter with, you know, a, a career behind me of, of esteemed uh, uh, clients and, and name recognition. I was just a 29-year-old, you know, uh, nobody uh, who had this sort of concept to sell. And I did it by knocking on doors and convincing people of the value proposition of dispute resolution. And it really does sell itself when people particularly can experience the process and see what the opportunities are for cost savings, for time savings, the kinds of things that David Lees described so well this, this evening for most of you are, are there to, to be seen and experienced and felt by people going through the process. And so it was just incumbent on me to try and build the trust and the credibility that we've been talking about with the legal community particularly because in, it's certainly in my experience in the United States, and I think as I train mediators in different parts of the world, I think the common thread that develops in those conversations is how do you bring along the rest of the community? How do you develop that sort of trust in the process uh, that has been discussed by, by David and Georgi and others uh, this morning or this evening, depending on where we are? <clears throat> and it, you know, trust takes time to develop takes a minute to destroy, but it takes time to develop. And so you have to be patient. And the more you can get people to experience it, because as we know from a neurobiological level, experience is really where it's at. That's really what uh, imprints uh, the value of this process on people's brains in a way that uh, nothing else will. But getting lawyers to trust is really a longer conversation. It's a process of breaking down the fear, largely, that keeps them from trying to engage, fear that's sometimes based on economic concerns, fear that's based on the unknown of the process, a suspicion of the process. And that's why, frankly, you know, seven years into developing online mediation curriculum, we finally realized a couple years ago, we need to address the stakeholder community of lawyers. We need to help them learn how to deliver winning results for their clients in this new forum, different than the traditional litigation environment. And once they learn that, it breaks down those concerns, those suspicions. It builds a level of trust and confidence in the process itself so that they know that that's a, a process that's available to them, not to the exclusion of other processes, but in appropriate use in a time and place that makes sense. And so now we're really trying to redouble our efforts to train lawyer populations in various countries uh, to sort of bring them along as you mediators develop your culture of mediation in Tbilisi and Georgia more generally. Pauline? Wow, these are such inspiring stories. Um, I, I, I first got trained in the late 80s. Uh, I went to a small Quaker college, and I don't know if anyone knows about Quakers, but uh, the Quakers are a very small uh, religious group in the United States, and they came to dispute resolution for theological reasons. Uh, but they did a training, and I had always wanted to be a peacemaker, and when I first got exposed to dispute resolution, I said, aha, this is it. This is practical peacemaking. This is the science of peacemaking, the social psychology, the game theory, all of it kind of rung a bell with me. And I've, uh, every minute of my career since then has been in the dispute resolution space. Um, so I, I, I find it uh, part art and part science. And that's all I want to do. My wife says, don't you want to do something else with your career? I'm like, no, this is all I want to do. I want to be around mediators. I want to resolve disputes. And I, I also wanted to echo what Bruce said about David's comments. Um, you know, I think business people don't like conflict. Because conflict represents inefficiency, conflict represents a lack of trust, it represents a lack of predictability and stability. So I think some of our biggest uh, partners and advocates in spreading dispute resolution are business people and business associations. So I think the EBA is a perfect host for the MAC. Um, so th those are my abbreviated comments, but let's see what other questions people have. Um, 
uh, thank you, Colin. And I think the next question goes to you. Your answer will be uh, very interesting. Um, so the question was, what are the interrelations between ODR and ADR? So mm -hmm. which notion is more broad and how, how can you describe it? And also in Georgia, the next question wasn't, but I think we can ask it uh, jointly. Uh, the next question was that in Georgia after pandemic, the government used the word in the, in the government ruling remote mediation. Mm -hmm. So what are the interrelations between all the three, the ADR, ODR, remote mediation? What's your feelings and thoughts about it? Yeah, and I think one of the things I said earlier is ODR is ADR, and I think that's true. I think if you have a doctor that's traditionally done surgery and they used a scalpel they held in their hand, and then you come into them and say, hey, hey, why don't you try this? It's a laser, and you can do the same things you did with the scalpel, but it's actually a little bit uh, more precise, a little bit more uh, safe. The doctor then puts the laser in their hand, and they say, wow, this is better. I like this. But the doctor doesn't say, I'm doing something totally different now. Uh, all they're doing is up, upgrading their tools. And what I encourage all of us to do is think of ODR as just putting additional tools in our toolbox. The objective of, of an online mediator is the same as a face-to-face -face mediator. And that's what I mean when I say ODR is a how, not a what. Uh, and when you talk about remote mediation, again, that's another, that's emphasizing one benefit of online dispute resolution, which is the use of technology to enable people to participate in processes remotely. Uh, Bruce was talking about engagement. It's amazing once you start to use Zoom, you can get access to parties who wouldn't have been able to make it to the to the Capitol, or maybe they are differently abled and it's hard for them to get around. We were talking about the, the quadriplegic gentleman who was able to participate in the process. So again, I want us to think about this as an expansion of the work that we are already doing. The objectives of ODR are exactly the same as, as the objectives of ADR. It is merely a question of the means, the tools that we use to achieve those objectives. When we first started the ODR field, the reason why I was part of the conversation when we named the field, and we talked talk about lots of things. I think someone said in the comments about OADR, people talked about technology, technology assisted, technology enhanced dispute resolution. But we chose the words ODR because we wanted to emphasize that ODR and ADR are very closely related. And the early ODR processes were exactly the same as face-to-face -face processes, just brought online. My first online mediation flow was exactly the process I was trained in the late 80s by the Quakers. But what we started to realize was technology opened up exciting possibilities that were either highly impractical, if not impossible, face-to-face. -face. And now what we see is new tools and new technologies, as we discussed before with artificial intelligence and blockchain and, and machine learning and smart contracts, we never could have done those face-to-face. -face. I could never convene a jury of 100 people to resolve a $50 dispute face-to-face. -face. But on eBay, I did that tens of thousands of times because technology makes that feasible. So we are still continuing to explore the possibilities that technology brings into dispute resolution. But if there's one message that I can leave with all of you, it's that ODR and ADR are the same thing. It's just using the additional tools at our disposal to achieve the same end objective, which is helping our parties prevent, manage, and resolve their disputes. Uh, Georgi, uh, with, your, with your permission, yes. uh, there's one question that's up here I'd like to make sure that we touch upon that I think is a technique, a specific technique, that it's kind of fun to just talk about a little bit more specifically this particular technique. I don't want to forget, David, to say hello to you again. Uh, it's been a while since we had our lunch or dinner together in Tbilisi, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. And congratulations on all the terrific work you're doing with Georgi and, and what you're building. It's just really exciting to see all of that. So hello again. Um, the question I wanted to raise, which I think we'll all have some fun with, uh, but it's a very good one, is how can mediators use humor at a very hot negotiation? Does it have any negative sides? Humor can be such a powerful uh, technique. I think we've all experienced it. So I wanted to give both Bruce and Colin an opportunity to speak to that issue because I know we have all experienced that point when people are ready literally to shoot each other and the well-placed humor when sensitive and tactful 
uh, can bring about some terrific results. And when it's not, it can be catastrophic. Uh, would either of you like to comment on, on that technique? The, um, uh, that's a, it's a question, obviously, that transcends today's dialogue, but an important one. Uh, first of all, maybe the best advice um, I ever got as a young lawyer about being a trial lawyer was when a senior partner talked to me about the importance of being authentic. And authenticity, I think, is an important word in the conversation of mediation skill development. And, by, and, and I've certainly taken that same message into my life as a mediator. We are who we are. Uh, you know, I work for and sometimes uh, involve in governance of an organization that has over 400 mediators. And that means there's at least that many different personality types and approaches to mediation. And I assure you, not all of them are humor-filled personalities. <laughs> um, so you have to be authentic. Bruce? Um, I think Bruce is frozen. Hopefully he'll kick back in in one minute. But it might be an internet hiccup. You are an expert, Coley. <laughs> Either that or he's, he's, uh, he's, he's freezing because he's making a joke because it's, uh, you know, he's responding about humor. That would, be a, that would be very impressive. Let me weigh in with my thoughts about this and then Bruce can continue when he reconnects. You know, uh, uh, sometimes, as, as all couples do, my wife and I will get into a fight. She'll be really mad at me, and she'll be yelling at me. And if, if I can get her to smile, if I can get her to laugh, I know the argument is over. And I think many of us have seen uh, that aspect of humor is there's, there's an element of connection and rapport. And, it, the, you know, we, there's a lot of talk in the United States right now about the neuroscience of conflict. Uh, because now we can look into people's brains and we can actually see CAT scans of what's going on in their head when they're engaged in a conflict. And I think the part of your brain that reacts with humor, and this is hum it's universal across every person on the planet, is, is diametrically opposed to the part of your brain that, gets, that makes you angry and upset and escalates and engages in the threats and violence. So I agree with what Vic said. I think uh, a mediator needs to be very careful with humor. Because what, what happens is if the parties are not ready for the humor and the mediator tries to go funny, sometimes it can undermine the seriousness of the process and it can make the parties lose a little bit of trust in the behavior of the neutral because maybe they feel like the, uh, the neutral is not taking the case seriously. I'm going to mute uh, Vic for a minute while he talks to Bruce. Um, so anyway, I think humor is a very important power in dispute resolution, but it has to be deployed very artfully and carefully and you have to look for that moment when you feel like there's just an, an opportunity with the parties to make a joke or make something funny or lighten the mood. And I think if used effectively, it can be enormously, enormously uh, useful in a dispute resolution process. So that's my thought. Uh, thank you, Colleen. All right, just Vic. Question sorry, here. sorry, I, I muted you, you, Vic, please. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself. That's another beautiful thing about online dispute resolution is you have the mute button. Uh, you know, we don't have that in the real life. We can't walk around and then mute people on the street. It would be lovely if we did have that feature. But uh, on I, as the host in this meeting, I have the power of the almighty mute button. So let's not overlook the, the, uh, the joy that comes with having that kind of power. Bruce, can you hear I'm us? sorry, Bruce. Uh, you, you cut out there in the middle. We were so interested in your comment. <laughs> Thank you. And I, again, one of the challenges of technology from time to time. Uh, but I always, it, it's a good example, just at a micro level. Uh, what I do at the beginning of mediations is I have my other computer set up next to me. I've got my cell phone. I give people my uh, cell phone number. I give them my email address. And I say, if something happens, call me. I'll walk you through getting back on. There's a different number of sort of communication channels we'll set up on a parallel track and make sure that if we have little hiccups along the way, we'll overcome them. So just a good uh, active lesson and sort of the things we deal with day in and day out. But to finish the thought, uh, just very briefly, um, you know, humor is uh, very disarming, um, appropriately used. It's a powerful technique. Just make sure that it's appropriately used and you have the personality and uh, sense of humor to be able to pull it off because there are those times uh, where it falls flat. And uh, there have been times where I've needed to apologize where my attempt at humor has uh, fallen short. Um, but that said, that'll, that'll complete the thought. Uh, we, uh 
I just want to jump in with a question with two students who are uh, very interested in this. And I think uh, Colin's thoughts are very interesting about it. The, the question, just to put it briefly, is that do you believe that ADR will disappear and the ODR will just replace it 100%? Colin, let, let me let you speak to that one first. Well, you know, the funny thing is, uh, 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 Jim Malamed, who is the, the, the past CEO of Mediate.com, he said to me back in 2001, you know, he said, you know, Colin, if you look out in the future and you squint a little bit, it's very hard to tell ADR from ODR. And I wouldn't say that ODR is going to replace ADR. Again, I'm trying to emphasize the fact that they're exactly the same thing. I go to meetings of mediators and I say to them, how many of you do ODR? No, no hands go up. This was before the pandemic. And then I said, okay, well, how many of you email your parties? How many of you send out calendar invitations? How many of you do Skype calls or audio conferences? How many of you send out word track changes documents with your settlement agreements? How many, and, and everybody sort of looks around and say, yeah, I guess we do do all of those things. And I say to them, that is ODR. You're doing ODR. Now you might not call it ODR, but that's exactly what it is. We can't hear you. We lost your audio. We lost your audio. Okay, huh. so uh, yeah. Uh, let me let me uh, kick in here, and, and hopefully, Colin, we'll get your audio back on because we've lost your audio for some reason. Um, uh, let me just comment to the question, and then I do know we have some time issues, Bruce, for you. I'm so okay. Oh, you're okay. Good. Okay, that's great. I didn't know if you how pressed you are. And Georg, we can uh, stay on for a few more minutes if you'd like okay. to. Okay. Question. Okay. Uh, I think we're fine. Love the boat week. But I do want to speak to this issue uh, with regard to uh, will it disappear? And I think the answer is uh, none of these are going to disappear. I think, as Colin started to say, uh, we're going to see, if you will, a hybrid. Uh, emerge, which is going to be a combination of ADR and a combination of ODR and a combination of these various techniques. And I don't know how it is for those others of you that are engaged in this, but I'm finding I'm doing that now. Uh, that in part, it may be phone calls at a time. In some cases where before the uh, COVID hit really hit us, uh, there were personal meetings that was followed by the phone and then by a Zoom conference. So I think for those of us that are going to be creative and embracing of this uh, technology and of these tools, as Colin has described them, what we're going to see is a continuation of tailoring, if you will, the uh, dispute resolution process to what the, works best for the parties. Uh, what they, as they get more sophisticated, they choose, or what you in your guidance in planning the dispute resolution process design with them. So that it may be, as I mentioned, a combination of a personal interchange, followed by some Zoom conferences, followed by telephone calls, uh, all of which we're starting to do now. And I think from that, we're going to have an, a really superb menu of options where the parties, and let's not forget this, the parties choose what they want and they think is most suitable for them so that it remains a voluntary process, not what you interpose in your wisdom, but rather what they voluntarily engage in, a critical prerequisite to a successful outcome, it seems to me that's what we're gonna see going ahead in the future. And all of these are gonna be part, if you will, of the menu of choices that we're gonna have in the foreseeable future. Absolutely, and Vic finished my thought perfectly. Thank you for, uh, I, Bruce uh, had his hiccup, I've had my hiccup. Uh, <laughs> I like to think we're staging these because we're trying to demonstrate you know, how you can recover. Uh, but no, that's exactly right. It's not that ODR is going to replace ADR. It's that technology is become, gonna become a part of every ADR process. So it's, it's an evolutionary uh, uh, move towards the use of greater technology and dispute resolution, and it's only to increase the efficacy of all of the approaches that we, we've been talking about. And, and not to be too theoretical, but I agree completely with Vic and Colin's comments about it being available on a menu of choices. But I just remind everybody, as I like to do in teaching moments, that as human beings, we're social creatures. We know from a neurobiological level that one of the two primary needs we have is to be connected. 
I read a study this past week that was fascinating coming out of the COVID-19 environment that people are starting to feel isolated and the instances of mental disease, depression and the like is increasing dramatically during this COVID uh, uh, time that we're all in. And the study said that something like uh, 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 human isolation is as detrimental to our human health as smoking a pack and a half of cigarettes each day. And uh, the real consequences of isolation uh, are, are becoming even more uh, profound, you know, during this COVID-19 moment. And it just reminds me of the whole uh, motivation I had early on 30 plus years ago in bringing people together in a face-to-face -face environment, because we are connected at various levels. Our efforts at dispute resolution of, often involve repairing or rebuilding those connections. And as, as Vic and Colin have so well stated, sometimes that can be done in a virtual environment, in a remote environment, and sometimes it'll best be accomplished in a face-to-face -face environment. And so it'll be incumbent on us to both respect the uh, wishes of those uh, parties in dispute, as Vic says, uh, or, or to add our own sort of impressions, but don't necessarily default immediately to the, the wishes of the lawyers or the clients because they might think that virtual or ODR mediation is, is the easiest, most convenient. There may be those cases that uh, uh, beg for more sort of a physical uh, uh, environment for, to create for people to get through these uh, gnarly problems that we address. Uh, Georgi has uh, reminded me we ought to be sensitive to everybody's time and perhaps bring this to a conclusion now. <clears throat> uh, I would like to add two uh, very brief points on this. One, uh, you see, we had some technical problems. And uh, this is something you prepare, if you will, the parties in advance for. And I have found, and I assume Colin and you, Bruce, have found the same thing, that I found uh, clients and lawyers are very understanding if that happens, particularly if you identify in advance. The one problem they don't want you to uh, foul up is confidentiality, which is another subject for another time, okay? We won't raise that right now. But the technical problem of losing somebody and having access to a phone, a cell phone to call them, as Bruce did to me, to tell me he's going to get back on while we were talking, all of that can smooth out the process beautifully. The second thing I want to respond to, there's a long question here, Georgi, that I want to at least give a brief response to, if I may, <clears throat> before we close, or I'll leave it to you to bring it to a close, about the problem of getting the clients to really understand the value of this process and not, not just going in and dragging them into court. Uh, it is a, a fairly lengthy question raising this once again. And this subject of how you speak to a client so they don't lose confidence in you, which I referred to before, and how you present to them the option of mediation, making sure they understand that they don't lose the right to go to court if they want to, that they can still do that, is a very important skill of whoever is advising that client. And I urge you, uh, Georgi, as well as David and others that may be working here in Georgia in the future, to spend time with those that are promoting mediation to learn that skill. Because uh, you can make them feel comfortable that you're willing to litigate a case without losing credibility, but present to them the option of trying mediation if you explain what the mediation process is about and get them to try it. And then once they start trying it more and more in Georgia, it sells itself. So I do want to underscore that there is a process here. Uh, and there's actually a, a bit of a, a seminar that I give uh, on that, th that very subject on how to persuade uh, clients and potential users on how to do it without compromising your relationship with your client. So Georgi, with that, I turn it back to you and or Colin or Bruce, if there's anything they want to raise in closing. But if this is the time, for us to wrap up, I want to give you that opportunity to do that. Thank you very much, Vic. Uh, and I Yogi, could I just say something about Vic's last course, point? Of course, David. Yeah. Um, just, I'm not, um, as you know, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but I, I do know about communications. And um, you mustn't underestimate this. Um, if this is fundamental, that people need to understand that you can go to mediation and then go to court, which I know, but most people don't. And I think there's, there's quite a hurdle there that, that you need to sort of incorporate this into the planning now. How do we get the message out? Uh, Mariam, the deputy CEO of uh, EBA, signed a, 
a big agreement uh, this week about the ethics of this. But I think there's a, a more, if you'd like, more of an almost an ad advertising type problem ahead of us. We've just got to get the message out so that people understand it. And I haven't fully thought about how you're going to do that, but it won't be very easy. Um, you've got to target it to the right people and you've probably got to change some misconceptions. And I think, I think that will be quite a challenge. Um, so something maybe that needs to be done quite quickly in Georgia, and you need to do it through the entire legal uh, community, which won't be too hard maybe, but you've then got to do it to the business community. And I think we need to start thinking about that very carefully. The, the PR and advertising side of this will, will be crucial to success, I think, in, in its uptake. Thanks very much, Georgie. Thank you very much, David. And thank you especially for raising this uh, question of ethics standards, which is a big challenge now in Georgia. I don't want to go deeply in this, but I fully agree with David that uh, unfortunately, uh, this was, uh, I would say, just a formal uh, thing. And there are formal thing, I mean, the uh, ceremony of signing the uh, ethics code and so on. So of course, it was a big step forward, but there are still challenges in this country. And I think we need to work together with business very hard and very closely to overcome all the problems and challenges uh, we have in this regard. And I just want to thank everybody once more and especially my special thank goes to my students who are now the absolute majority of, uh, of the participants. And I think that uh, this, gives me, this gives me a big hope that the next generation uh, will be more friendly, more ODR and ADR friendly, and they will change the mindset which is the biggest problem, I think, for uh, Georgia to develop ODR things. And this generation is able to do more than David or I can do. And they are ready and they are dedicated. And the only thing we can do and my generation can do for them is to bring as much people like you as it is possible and to bridge the contacts between the developed part of the world and these new beginners who are really eager to hear news, new things uh, in, in ADR, in mediation. And I strongly believe that this webinar will not be the last one and last activity for us. And we will continue in this regard and we will strive ourselves to develop ADR in Georgia with helping our friends from abroad and also helping from business sector and students, and of course, the lawyers who are the keys to their clients. Thank you very much once more for your time. And I really appreciate your help. And I strongly believe we will have more closer cooperation in the future. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Be, well. Be healthy. Stay Thank healthy. You. Take care. Bye. -bye. Take care. Bye. Colin and Victor, 